You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Get into the habit of not just clicking retweet, not just sharing. Get into the habit of kind of slowing down and calming down. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hello, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, Carol Terrio returns with a discussion on disinformation with author Tim Harford. All right, Joe, uh, let's uh, dive right into some stories here. And, um, you know, we're we're in this place now where the COVID-19 vaccines are being rolled out. Yes. Uh, I have not been vaccinated yet. Have you? No, not yet. Um, (laughs) I would love to be vaccinated right now. Well, some of our loved ones have have, have been vaccinated. My father's been vaccinated. Both Uh, my parents got vaccinated yesterday. My in-laws have been vaccinated. So it's sort of working its way down from the more Mm -hmm. elderly people. I think there's a lot of frustration that it's not happening more quickly. But there is hope. You know, I think it's a good thing that this this is underway and and so something that people can be happy about. But, of course, there is a certain amount of anxiety that comes with all of this that we've been Mm -hmm. experiencing for the past year. And that is, when will I be able to get vaccinated? Because, like you said, if I could, I'd... I'd put this recording of the show on pause and I'd go get vaccinated right now. Exactly. If possible. Dave, I am very <laughs> eager to get vaccinated. I want vaccination right now. And I am waiting for an email that tells me it's time for me to go get vaccinated. Right. Not surprisingly, there are a lot of folks who are taking advantage of that anxiety. Um, I have a report here from uh, the folks at Area One Security. They did a write up on a bunch of different phishing campaigns that they've been tracking that are all related to the vaccine and the availability of the vaccine. Uh, i just point out a couple of them here. One of them, you get an email, uh, it says that it's coming from Pfizer, who's one of the manufacturers of the vaccine. It has the CDC logo on it, the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, You open it up and there's an image. It uh, has, as I said, the CDC logo, the Pfizer logo. It looks very official. It's a decent graphic design. It says, you've received a secure message. Well, there you go. You convinced me. Uh, (laughs) There's a a secure. That's good to know. There's a check mark on it, which again, you know, another thing. It says, signature for vaccine 2690. Authorized Pfizer vaccine distribution use for your reference. Complete the form to ensure vaccine count for your area. So there's a button there for you to press, and if you press that button, it takes you to another website, which, wait for it, asks you for a whole bunch of personal information. Right. (laughs) Right, right. There's another one here also claiming to come from the Centers for uh, Disease Control and Prevention. Interestingly, these uh, folks didn't take as much care with theirs. They're trying to do a vaccine count, (laughs) V-A-S-S-I-N-E count, so I don't know. Uh, perhaps that's uh, vaccinating. Uh, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> These people have no intelligence, right. um, and uh, so I don't know. It's probably an auto translate problem. But uh, there's a bunch of these, and and they're making the rounds. I, I think it's worth reminding people that uh, to to spread the word about this. That if you're getting emails about because like here's the thing, my mother who has not yet been vaccinated, right? She signed up to be notified via email. Yep. When she can try to get an appointment to be vaccinated, she and my father are waiting for an email that yep, says exactly. Uh, so they are primed to be susceptible to this. And when you go to the website to sign up for your vaccine, they're going to ask you for a bunch of personally identifiable information, right? Right. It seems only natural. You have to make an appointment for a vaccine. You're expecting that workflow. So if you go into a phishing landing page and it just asks you for more information than you need, like your social security number, birth date, driver. In fact, birth date might even be on the actual legitimate pages for registering because right now they're breaking it down by age, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody over the age of 65 can get one. Well, in order to know if you're over the age of 65, I might need to know your birthday. Actually, what I need to know is the year in which you were born and just say, okay, anybody 64 and up can get it. That's fine with me. I don't care if some 64-year-olds sneak into this process. (laughs) 
They're going to put your birthday on there. So that's not an unexpected piece of information to ask for. They might also ask for, in on the phishing landing pages, you can see them asking for social security number, driver's license number, all kinds of information. Uh, mm-hmm. But that would not seem out of the ordinary for a government service to ask for that information. No, no. And they point out that uh, when these phishing emails are sent out, a lot of times they're spoofing who it's coming from. So it actually looks like it's coming from Pfizer or or the CDC, which makes right. it even harder to track down. I mean, I guess you have to be careful, obviously, uh, where these things take you to when they land, the website that this takes you to. But this is t- it's a tough one because people are they're expecting this. They're excited to get this. This is good news, right. right, when you can go register to be vaccinated. So this is a hard one to fight against, I think. You just have to be vigilant and, and just try to be extra careful. Well, we've been warning about this on this show for a number of months. I think you and I were talking back in December about how this is coming when the vaccines, because once the vaccines were approved, you and I said, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. This is like one of my favorite things about working in this field is you can look like Nostradamus by predicting things that are going to (laughs) happen because (laughs) it's really, really easy to do that. Right. 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 If you just think of something bad that's going to happen, then you just say that's going to happen. And when it happens, you go, see, I was right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like being a weatherman. There's really there's not a whole lot of pressure, really. Right, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, that is my story. We'll have a, a link to this uh, research from the folks at Area One Security. Um, I think this is worth spreading around because the screen captures here of these emails, I mean, that might be a good thing to share with your friends and family so that if one of these pops up, folks will know this is what one of these scams looks like. So it is you can, very you can do it that way. Yep, absolutely. All right. That's my story this week. What do you have for us, Joe? Dave, this week, my story comes from Kevin Townsend over at Security Week, and he has an article titled, The Deep Analysis of More Than 60,000 Breach Reports Over Three Years. And they did this with a company called Hack Notice, which is a startup that started back in 2018 in Texas, and they are a threat intelligence and security awareness company. One of the key takeaways from this story is that, according to Hack Notice, data breaches that they track have gone up by more than 50% year over year since 2018. Thanks to the wonders of compound interest, if you will, uh, (laughs) they have more than doubled. They've gone from 29,000 data breaches in 2018 to 67,000 data breaches in 2020. That's more than double within two years. One of the things I wanted to focus on in this discussion is uh, some of the comments from people on why these data breaches have increased so much. And the Hack Notice CEO, Steve Thomas, uh, says companies concentrate defense in the wrong areas. And here's a great quote from him. Hackers are winning the cyber war largely because they don't target the infrastructure, but they target the people. Phishing, credential stuffing, account takeover of personal accounts to get into business accounts – All the major attack vectors rely on the fact that the average employees are not as informed as to how exposed they are, and they value security much less than the security team does. This is pointing to what we've been talking about also. Again, we've been saying this kind of thing for years. I love actually having these stories that kind of where people agree with what we say, that the average person doesn't take security as seriously as people on the security team, and they just don't believe that they have anything of value uh, when in Mm. fact they do. They are valuable for so many reasons, personal and professional. Right, right. It's a, it's a good point that, you know, in the same way that everyone in a company has a responsibility for making sure that the doors are locked up at night before you go home or, right. you know, that uh, the inventory is secure. You know, you're not leaving doors open or vehicles unlocked or anything like that. Basic physical security that we all agree to as part of a, a team with a company that applies to online security as well. You need to have that vigilance. You, you need to be part of the security team. Everybody does. Everybody does. That's exactly right. Josh Angle, who's an application security consultant at Invisium, says human error still accounts for the vast majority of breaches, making tools and secure coding practices obsolete if the people who maintain these networks and systems and have access to the company emails and sensitive client data are not compliant with industry best practices. So in other words, it doesn't matter how many tools you have. If you have one guy who gives away the access, it's done, right? The access is given away. If the security guard lets everybody into the vault, <laughs> right. that's, that's it. Game over, right? Right. Yeah, but like you said, we're all security guards, right? Right, so right, right. That's a lot of people that can let people into the vault. Brandon Hoffman, who's CISO at Net Entrench, says several factors play into the increase in breaches 
Some of this is indeed related to ingenuity of the adversary, but much of it seems to be related to the deviation from foundational security. Security tooling has advanced significantly, yet the focus of security as a discipline seems to be more on the use of advanced tooling. The challenge this creates is time and resources. So basically what he's saying is that we, we spend a lot of time focusing on these these tools. Well, and everybody wants to have the latest, greatest, shiniest object tools, right? There's one more great quote from this article <laughs> that says, defenders are perhaps spending too much time and effort on shiny new toys rather than getting the basics of security right. We have the technology. The technology is actually pretty good right now. I mean, yeah, there's vulnerabilities in software, but really, uh, I have to agree with a lot of the people in this article, including Steve Thomas, the CEO from Hack Notice. The basics of security are the, are the most important thing in the world. Teaching people that security is their responsibility in a corporation and telling people that when you're at home, you have a lot of responsibility for your own security. That's important. People have to get that. And for some reason, we've been we've been struggling with this. That's why we have this podcast. That's why we do this every week is to try to get this message out and try to make people understand you are susceptible to these kind of attacks. Yeah, no, everybody has to play their part for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, we will have a link to that in the show notes as always. Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes from a listener named John. And John writes, my wife was on Facebook the other day and saw this in one of the groups she's in. Once she translated it, I knew that I had to send it to see if you'd enjoy it as much as we did. It's in badly broken Lithuanian, which she has helpfully translated as precisely as possible. Enjoy. So, Dave, uh, this message was originally written in some unknown language, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then auto-translated into Lithuanian, mm -hmm, and then translated mm -hmm. to English by John's wife, whom I assume is fluent in both English and Lithuanian. Mm. So I think you're going to enjoy reading this one, Dave. All right. Uh, I will do my best. Okay. Hello. Very sad if you're a polite. I want to donate 105,000 euros. My name is Mrs. Anna Susanna. I grew up in Lithuania and now live in France. I agree that in my brain there's a deadly reputation illness which the doctor has just informed me on and that my days are numbered with my declining daily health. I cannot live in this country much longer. I am sick with this illness for more than six years. In a car accident, I lost my mother and husband and I haven't had kids in my life. I want to donate 105,000 euro to anyone that needs it so that this amount is used properly. As a gift, I am looking for a sincere good heart. So if anyone is interested in my donatable 105K, now my death can count my days. When this disease is not here, for which there is no cure. If you need my donations, please contact me via email. Thank you, and may God bless you. That's amazing. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. I, I love how this, this kind of rolls off the tongue. First off, for our listeners at home... Dave does that in one take almost every time. <laughs> I don't know how he does that. I could not stammer my way through this in one take if my life depended on it. <laughs> I have an amazing ability to disconnect my brain from in between my eyes and my mouth so I can read the words and have them come out and not be bogged down by actually processing it. It's a that's, gift. Yeah, that's that's a <laughs> gift. That is. <laughs> that's amazing. So this is obviously just a just a scam like a beneficiary scam. Right. Mm -hmm, I got, mm -hmm. Hey, look, I've got all this money. I'm trying to give it away before I die. We see, we see these a lot, but I thought this one was interesting because it was obviously translated from some third language to Lithuanian, then from Lithuanian to English. Talk about getting lost in translation that this. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. This is awesome. All right. Well, we appreciate John writing that in. That was a good one. Uh, that was our catch of the day. We would love to hear from you. Uh, if you want to uh, send us a catch of the day, you can send it to hackinghumans at the cyberwire.com. Uh, Joe, it is always great when Carol Terrio returns to the show. Can't get enough of uh, her stories and the things that she shares with us. This week, she's got a good one. Uh, she interviews uh, Tim Harford. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an author, also a, a TV personality. Evidently, I believe he's a little more well-known on her side of the pond over in the UK than he is here. Yep. But uh, when you listen to this interview, you'll understand why. A really interesting conversation. Here's Carol Terrio. So, Tim Harford, thank you so much for coming on Hacking Humans. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. 
Okay, so just a bit of background before we get to you. So for people out there, Tim is actually a household name in my home. Now, we primarily know him from his BBC work, host of More or Less and How to Vaccinate the World, both amazing shows. But Tim, you have your mitts in so many other pies. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Yes, as the Italians would say, you know, many fingers in the pasta. Um, <laughs> so I, I also have a podcast called Cautionary Tales, which is stories of catastrophe, fiasco, and you know, one of the nerdy lessons of what we can learn from what went wrong. That's made by Pushkin, Malcolm Gladwell's podcasting company in the US. And I write for the Financial Times and I write books. And the most recent book is called how to make the world add up, which is all about you know, the technical side, but more importantly, the psychological side of using statistics to think clearly about the world. See, you're such a perfect guest for this show because we are going to talk today about all things disinformation or misinformation. Actually, is there? do you know if there's a difference between the two? That there is thought to be a difference between the two. Disinformation is deliberate and misinformation may or may not be deliberate. I never knew that. That's very useful. There you go. I think today most of us feel we are in the disinformation and misinformation crosshairs. And many assume that this is because of the internet and social media and all these things, that these things are to blame. But you're saying this is not a new phenomenon at all. It's really not. One of the first stories I tell in my book begins in 1937 with a wonderful old art critic called Abraham Bradius, who is recognized as the world's leading authority on Rembrandt and Vermeer. And he is, at the age of 82, he's approached by a charming lawyer called Gerard Boone, who's a committed anti-fascist. He's a really really good guy. He tells him this story about this uh, anti-fascist family in Italy who uh, want to flee uh, Mussolini's oppression and go to America. And they've got this painting and they think maybe it might be worth something. And Bradius is the the only guy who he would really trust with, to, to make that assessment. Um, and by the way, Gerard Boone believes all of this. So Bradius says, okay, fine, I'll, I'll take a look. Boone is a really distinguished pillar of the Dutch establishment. <laughs> Did people trust lawyers back then? Or is that, is that a new thing that we think they're sharks? Yeah, now? lawyer and politician, it turns out. Um, but yeah, but he, you know, he was standing up to Hitler back in 1933. Yeah. I mean, he's a great guy. And Bradius opens the parcel and, and, and looks at this huge canvas and he is completely spellbound. And he says, you, you know what we have here? This is, this is a Vermeer. Wow. And, and there are only about 40 Vermeers in the world. He's a very mysterious painter from the 1650s, 1640s. And um, Bradius says, when I, he wrote about it shortly afterwards. He said, when I first saw this work, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. Mm. And that's the problem. He had difficulty controlling his emotion. It was a rotten, rotten fake, really bad fake, totally corrupt, painted by um, a really nasty uh, Dutch Nazi called uh, Han van Megelen. Who obviously must have been pretty good with his paintbrush. Well, he was all right. He was okay with the paintbrush. He was much better with the industrial chemistry. So he, one of the things he did was uh, he, he used absolutely the right pigments and he painted it on a 17th century canvas you know, over the top of an old 17th oh. century painting and he hardened it with Bakelite because oil paintings, I didn't know this until I started looking into this, but oil paintings take uh, you know, 50 years to dry fully. Yeah. And so Bradius is looking at all of this and he's saying, well, it's a 17th, you know, I know it's a 17th century canvas. I know these are authentic pigments. These are the pigments that Vermeer himself would have used. Uh, the paint is hard. Uh, he's looking at all of these details and he's not going, huh, not a very good painting though, is it? Wow. And so the reason that I began a book about statistics with a story about an art forgery is because I wanted to understand how it is that we often collude in our own downfall, how we often fool ourselves. And for Bradius, it was this combination of wishful thinking. He really wanted to find one more, one more Vermeer before he died wishful thinking, very powerful. Plus, once he wanted to believe it, his expertise was actually telling, giving him signals that 
you or I would never have noticed, oh, this is a 17th century canvas. Uh, look, you know, the pigments are authentic. Mm-hmm. But for Bradius, he, he, he picked up all of these little reasons to believe and, of course, ignored this one big reason to believe, which is that the painting never looked like anything Vermeer ever did. I, I want to say the word ironically here because I think I'm using it correctly, but is it ironic that he was duped by the science? So uh, I, I looked at some psychological research on... The no, the term for this is motivated reasoning. Okay. You know, want to re- reach a certain belief that fits in with your preconceptions. So there's a lot of work on motivated reasoning in politics. And um, one of the studies I looked at, very interestingly, pointed out that people who were more expert, who knew more about politics, actually fell harder for some of these cognitive traps. Motivated reasoning is is the gun and your knowledge is the ammunition. Like you've got so many more bullets in that gun, which you're right. going to fire hard into your own foot uh, and fool yourself. And people who d- actually didn't know very much didn't have the cognitive ammunition to reach the wrong conclusion. They were just like, oh, I don't know. It might be for me, it might not be. What do I know? Whereas for Bradius, he found all these reasons. So for example, for example, if I were to apply this to a modern world scenario, this would be a bit like me already having preconceived ideas of, I think this is the place that I need to get my news for, in my mind, because I followed them for a long time or they have a strong reputation or whatever. But those things can also hinder me into actually analyzing the story and looking for all the different clues that might suggest it is not as good as it is, is yeah, that absolutely. Fair? So, so for for example, there's a whole narrative in the UK at the moment about how serious is is COVID really, and the people who are very keen to make the case that it's it's actually really overblown and it's really not that dangerous. Some of them are going really deep. I mean, there's some which is, there's some people who just don't know anything about the subject at all, but. You know, you could talk to people who know a lot about PCR tests and will tell you, oh, look, there's this particular laboratory in Cambridge and we think that their PCR tests are contaminated. And also, if you look at the research on asymptomatic cases, it shows actually a lot of cases are asymptomatic and there's this other thing. You know, and actually, if you really know what you're talking about, you can pick all that apart and go, all of this is nonsense. Actually, there's a lot of detail there supporting the mistaken belief. And this, of course, the simplest thing to believe about COVID is, well, you know, look, um, a lot of people seem to be dying. It probably is pretty bad. I mean, that's, the, you know, that, that's your Occam's razor. <laughs> um, but, you, you, you know, you have to work quite hard to, to get deep into it and to start finding reasons to disbelieve all of that. But some people will. So right now we're sitting here, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Holidays are or have just passed and, and we are under the impression that loads and loads of people are trying to take something from us, be it our information, be it our monies, be it whatever. Is there cognitive techniques that you have researched that allow us to be able to handle this better? Yeah, there are. And I think the very first thing I would say is don't despair because there's a lot of perfectly good, solid information out there. There are lots of trustworthy sources, there are lots of journalists doing really good work mm. who will give you the context, who will give you the footnotes, who will check their sources. Uh, and I think one trap we fall into, which I write about in, in the introduction to How to Make the World Add Up, is to just think it's all lies. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's that's where we... You can get into this really, really grim... Uh, views of the world where you just think everybody is lying to me all the time. And this is this is a part of the Vladimir Putin's propaganda strategy in, in Russia. Mm. It's like there's just so much you, no no one's no one's fooled, but but people don't even believe the truth. It's not they don't believe the lies, they don't believe the truth either. I just so, heard that yesterday from a friend who just said, I'm just staying away from the news because I don't know what to believe and it's too complicated for me to do the homework. So I'm just staying away from it. Yeah. So step one, don't don't despair. The yeah. truth is out there. Okay. Step two is don't be like Abraham Bradius. Notice your emotions. Don't get carried away by your, yeah. your emotions. A lot of the, the media that we see, whether it's social media, whether it's newspaper headlines, it is designed to get a rise out of us. Social media thrives on this and it could be anger, it could be joy. So whenever you see a claim, just say to yourself, am I having an emotional reaction to this? Am I thinking... Oh, that's fake news. Mm. Or this proves uh, I was right all along. Wait till I tell my wife. Wait till I tell my husband about this. You know, they'll realize I was smart. Or, you know, it can't possibly be true. I can't believe it. You know, that must be the, the, the lamestream media. Whatever it is, just calm down for a moment. Notice the emotion. Then go back and start thinking clearly. 
you don't need me to tell you that you know, your classic kind of con approach is the scam is is to to get people in a hot state, get people fearful, agitated. They and you got to you got to do it now. Do it yeah, now, Make, right now. Yeah, you have minutes to take advantage of this or something. Absolutely, absolutely classic. Whether it's greed or whether it's fear. Well, a lot of it's FOMO, right? It's a lot of fear of missing out. Yeah. You know, a lot of these things I see are like the short-term deals. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course, you know, we're all potentially vulnerable. I mean, you can't say, oh, well, I know these tricks. So, I mean, let me give you an example. I don't think I was conned, but I'm still trying to find out. Ooh, tell us. Just a couple of days ago, so a guy in a UPS uniform with a UPS van outside my house with a big UPS parcel standing on the door and he says... Uh, I'm afraid you've got to pay, you know, VAT and customs on this parcel. Oh, goodness. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, cash or check. I was like, okay, fine. I sort of get 30 quid, give him the 30 quid. And, uh, and he's like, and UPS haven't even given me the facility to give you a receipt. So you have to go on the UPS website to sort that out. And he kind of strolls off. And, I, and then I'm thinking... I just handed him 30 quid. <laughs> I just gave this guy 30 quid and didn't give him a receipt. I mean, I did get the parcel. And, you know, he had a UPS van. Yeah, it's probably you know it's probably just UPS, you know, not having their processes in order. But if you had sat me down and said, okay, in one minute there's going to be a UPS guy, he's going to show up, he's going to ask you for thirty quid cash and not give you a receipt, yeah. what are you going to do? I'd say I tell him to to go away and come back when he's got a receipt. Exactly. But I didn't because I was in a hurry. So yeah. you know, in the book, some people say, oh, you've you've given these ten commandments in how to make the world add up, but actually. I don't think of them as commandments. I think of them as sort of habits that we need to try to train ourselves to get into, get into the habit of not just clicking retweet, not just sharing, get into the habit of kind of slowing down and calming down. I know. And there's a real weird push pull between us, because if we use your example, you just gave about the UPS guy, you have security. So for example, you could have, if say you were on high alert at this point, you might have said, look, I'm going to take a picture of you and your badge just to make sure Right. And let me just grab the license plates of your truck. You know, and you don't mind, do you? But then in a way, you're invading that person's privacy if, in fact, they're bona fide and legit and they just didn't have receipts or whatever. Yeah. And you, and you feel like, you know, God, suddenly I'm your. <laughs> There's another story. I haven't got time to go into the, to the details, but it's, um, it's one of the early episodes of Cautionary Tales. Uh, it's in Berlin in the early 20th century. And it begins with a junior military officer being stopped on the street by a commanding officer, a captain, who, who says, you know, where are you taking all these men? You've got four privates with him. Where are you taking this men? Uh, come with me. I've got an urgent uh, business for the Kaiser himself. And they march along the street and then they meet some other privates. And, you know, they, suddenly he's got a little army, he's got about 10 of them. And his, you know, his name is uh, Captain Wilhelm Voigt. And they take the train across Berlin and then they, you know, they arrest a local mayor and they, they confiscate his money and, and, take them out to the police station. He's wanted for questioning. And the captain you know, has, this, has this sort of bag of money under his arm. He says, well done, everyone's done very well. They all disappear. He goes to Berlin railway station, disappears into a, a lavatory cubicle, comes out wearing plain clothes, and then he's, ne he's never seen again. And it's just this, it's the same thing. It's the UPS guy. Huge con. The UPS guy in the uniform. I just love this guy. Because there's a guy in, guy in the captain's uniform and you're a, you're a corporal. What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to, you're not yeah. going to say, well, uh, I don't think I've seen you before, Captain. Where's your, where's your identification? It'd be court martial. Yeah. It's like in the movies, you know, you always have these scenes where some kind of strange car pulls up, someone dapperly dressed opens up the car and they say, get in, you know, and you're always thinking like, you know, why do people get into the car? I mean, obviously to make yeah. the story, but you know, were that to happen to you, were it a bus that you were expecting, of course you'd hop on, right? Or if it was a cab you ordered, but if it was any other car, would we get in and, or would we yeah. do our, you know, our due diligence beforehand? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tim's new book is How to Make the World Add Up. It's available wherever you get your books. And also check out his new podcast, Cautionary Tales. I had to listen to the first one and I thought it was fantastic. What high production. Yeah, we, we're working hard. We're having fun. Tim Harford, thank you so much. You're such fun to talk to, Carol. Thank you. As are you. This was Carol Terrio for Hacking Humans. All right, Joe, what do you think? Great interview. I love that interview. I want to talk about a little bit of misinformation here, Dave. Are you allowed to kill a praying mantis in Maryland? Uh, hmm, I, 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 I probably, I've heard this, I've heard this, the, right. this is, this rings a bell with me. We have, yeah. now we have praying mantises here in Maryland. They are a common 
insect. They, I, there's also my favorite insect. Uh, they're really cool. They are awesome uh, bugs, yeah. The, I guess a better question is, is a praying mantis allowed to kill me? Because right. that's, the, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the real fear here. But is, am I allowed to kill a, a praying mantis in self-defense? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, but, I've, but I believe I've taken you off the rails here. That, that what is the point of your question? I had to do yes. it, officer. <laughs> exactly. What is, what is the point of your question, Joe? My point is that I grew up believing that it was illegal to kill praying mantises. Hmm. It was folklore around here. When I got older, I was an adult working down in Crystal City, and I had I took a van pool, and the driver of the van pool was an entomologist. And uh, we were talking, and I asked him, I said, why is it illegal to kill praying mantises? I, I see them all over the place. And he says, I don't know where this myth comes from. There is nothing illegal about killing praying mantises. If you want to kill a praying mantis, you can kill a praying mantis. It's fine. I mean— hmm. I don't know why you'd go out and kill one. They're they're awesome bugs, as you say. I <laughs> right, enjoy right, enjoy seeing right. them. But there there is nothing illegal about it. But growing up, I believed with all my heart that it was illegal to do this. Yeah, I, I, I heard that growing up here as well. There was no publicly accessible internet at that point in time. I wasn't right. on the internet back in the 70s and early 80s. So this was not something that came around from the internet. And that's kind of what Tim is talking about here. This is not anything new, this this massive amounts of, of mis and disinformation, but we do see it being amplified by social media. One of the things that he says in here that's that's absolutely of uh, probably the most important thing he says is when he's talking about the guy with the uh, piece of art that he thinks is from the Dutch master. I can't remember the name of the master, but he says, mm-hmm. uh, I, I had difficulty controlling my emotions. Mm-hmm. And that, as Tim puts it, allows us to collude in our own downfall. <laughs> it's a good phrase. <laughs> this is the crux of the matter of social engineering. Uh, you have difficulty controlling your own emotions and, and thinking clearly about things. Motivated reasoning is very interesting to me. It sounds a lot like uh, confirmation bias. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's two different things. But, uh, you know, you go out looking for things that confirm your belief systems. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Sounds very similar. I like what Tim says about noticing your emotions when you're online or when you're engaged with somebody. Notice how things make you feel. This is what social media uses to make its money. Right. This is how Facebook and Twitter keep you engaged. They they show you things that elicit an emotional response that they know will keep you looking at the page. And it also works in news organizations. These 24-hour news cycles that we have all over the cable, the different channels, Mm -hmm. these people need to keep you engaged. They need to sell advertising. So they want you to be emotionally invested so that you don't turn them off, so that they get the ratings. So they sensationalize the news, right? Sure, sure. This is also nothing new. We had a similar problem back at the turn of the 20th century in yellow journalism. The journalism about 150 years ago was also just as bad. It was awful. And the important thing to remember is that scams work on all these same tools, right? That our emotions are what they use against us. They try to get us to stop stop thinking and start feeling. And that's when you start running into problems. I think this was a really great interview. I really enjoyed hearing Tim talk. I think I'm going to check out the podcast that that they plug at the end of this. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, again, our thanks to Carol Terrio for uh, bringing that interview to us. Uh, Thanks to Tim Harford for taking the time for her and for us. Of course, we want to thank all of you for listening. That is our show. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.